This video is going to be on testicular pathology. We'll start with the basics. They start in your abdomen and they descend, correct? And if they fail to descend, we call that cryptorchidism. So, cryptorchidism. The most common congenital abnormality of the testes, they just stay in your abdomen. And for the most part, they descend on their own. They might just take a little bit more time, but if they don't descend, then the temperature in your abdomen is way too hot for your testes, so you have increased temp. And remind me again what cells are susceptible to temperature changes. Those would be your Sertoli cells. So, so your Sertoli cells die, your Leydig cells, you know, they're fine. They're not temperature sensitive. And with decreased Sertoli cells, you don't create a hormone. Do you remember that hormone's name? That'd be your inhibin. And without inhibin, you lose that negative feedback, so you have increased FSH, increased LH, and the increased LH further stimulates your Leydig cells. Those are the cells that aren't temperature sensitive, so you have pronounced Leydig cells, pronounced Leydigs, but decreased Sertoli's. The culmination of which just makes your testes defunct. So you're gonna have increased infertility and because they're and because they're not normal, you're at an increased risk of cancer, testicular cancer. That's all from the failure of your testes to descend as cryptorchidism. Now a lot of fluids pass in and out of your testes. We talked about um, lymph drainage, gonadal drainage, sperm movement. So if sperm doesn't drain and leave the testes as it should, if it builds up, then you can have a pocket of um, semen or sperm. We call that spermatocele. And you can palpate it as this flexuant mass right above the testes. That's your spermatocele. Another fluid that drains this is blood. So if you have stasis of blood, you can have um, dilation of veins, especially these very small veins called your pampiniform venous plexus. These are small veins that will eventually unite into your gonadal vein. And if these dilate, you can feel that dilation, you can see that dilation, and you can palpate that dilation. It feels kind of like worms right above the testes. We call that varicocele. An important complication of this varicocele is that all that blood, we're warm blooded, right? So all that blood near your testes increases the temp and anytime you have increased temp, you tell me what cells are susceptible. Those are your, your Sertoli cells. So you have decreased Sertoli cell function and decreased sperm, um, decreased fertility. One important association you need to know is going to be with renal cell carcinoma. We talked about this in the previous video. If it invades, recall your left gonad drains into your left renal vein and then it hops over into the IVC. So if something's wrong with that left renal vein, if you have RCC or renal cell carcinoma and it invades into your left renal vein, you can have varicocele. What do we always do when we see an association? We don't just memorize association. We come with everything we know about that association. So tell me everything you know about just a common renal cell carcinoma. So renal cell carcinoma is from your PCT. They arrive from PCT associated with VHL syndrome, um, uh, large yellow mass grossly. On histology, you have these large vacated cells, can produce EPO and cause secondary polycythemia. So all these stuff, again, Instead of just knowing an association, make sure you can take it one step further, list everything you know about it, and then synthesize it into a step by questions. So if a patient comes in with a flank mass, has hematuria, and then has, feels a heaviness in his testes, and you feel um, a dilation in his, in his testes, you're not caught off guard, you know the association of our, you can identify RCC and varicocele. Got it? So an important thing to know, varicoceles, varicoceles does not Trans illuminate. What does that mean? One of the things we can do on physical exam is just take a flashlight and look at the look at the mass, see if it trans illuminates, lights up. And things that are solid, like tumors, or things that are full of 
dark fluid or thick fluid like blood like varicoceles they don't transilluminate things that are with lighter fluids like sperm or semen will transilluminate so this will transilluminate another thing that's light and will transilluminate is something called hydrocele what the heck is a hydrocele well your testes aren't covered with some sort of epithelial layer your testes are instead covered with this serous this membrane so when you start in your abdominal and it starts to descend it pulls this uh, membrane from the peritoneum with it called the tunica vaginalis so it pulls this membrane with it so this is your testes and this is the membrane that covers it and then after it's descended the top part will obliterate and close that continuation with the peritoneum. If it doesn't obliterate and it doesn't close that, then it'll keep the process open and then serous fluid can drain into it and dilate this and cause a hydrocele. Hydrocele's are full of the serous fluid, the serous light fluid and will transilluminate. I guess those are all the, the dilation and the fluids I want to talk about. Another common testicular pathology that I like to talk about is orchitis or inflammation of the testes. That's what itis means. So orchitis can happen from STIs like chlamydia and gonorrhea. So I'll write orchitis. So STIs like chlamydia, gonorrhea, those are just the, the common um, STIs. It can come from a UTI that spreads to your testes. So the most common cause of a UTI, the most common bug, do you remember? That's gonna be your E. coli. And then one that you should know is mumps. Now mumps has basically been eradicated since vaccines, but with the, um, I guess, anti-vaxxer movements, you're gonna see a lot more mumps. Mumps can cause orchitis. How it causes orchitis or why it likes the testicles, I'm not quite sure. Nor am I sure why it spares children. So orchitis in mumps, you only see it in teenagers, so people over 10. In kids with mumps, you have the classical findings. But after 10, you're predisposed to orchitis, and all these things decrease fertility, as you would expect. So know these well. One more is autoimmune inflammation. We talked a little bit about that on, um, when we talked about the blood testes barrier. Autoimmune inflammation is a little more chronic, and anytime you have chronic inflammation, what can you see? If you say granulomas, you are correct. That is orchitis. Next up is the topic of torsion. So, so your testicle is held together by your spermatic cord and your spermatic cord has nerves and your paniniform plexus and a whole host of things. And if this cord twists, then you have something called testicular torsion, just kind of like ovarian torsion. So you have this acute onset of pain. When that nerve twists, you're gonna lose your chromosteric reflex. That's when you stroke your thigh and your testicle retracts. So that's gone. But more importantly, because you're twisting the blood vessels, you can have eventually necrosis if you don't, I guess, untwist it. That's the most important part. So it's a surgical emergency. And that is torsion. But the bread and butter of testicular pathology is gonna be your tumors. Testicular tumors are incredibly common in um, younger patients. And if you suspect a testicular tumor, if you see a mass, a very solid mass during palpation, doesn't transilluminate because masses don't transilluminate, you just take it out. You just take the testicle out. You don't biopsy. So I say don't biopsy if suspicious because you don't want to risk seeding, you just take the whole testicle out. And your testicular tumors are going to be similar to your ovarian tumors. We talked about the ovarian tumors, how we broke it down into the cell types, so epithelial cell, germ cell, stroma. Just know that your testicles don't have the epithelium. It's instead covered by the tunical vaginalis. So we still have your germ cells, which in fact is the most common, about 95%. We still have your stromas, but we don't have your epithelial cell tumors. Instead, we have something a little more unique, and that's your testicular lymphoma. We'll talk about this odd man now first. Testicular lymphoma is seen in older patients. 
that is a dead giveaway because testicular cancer is more common in younger patients. So if you see an older patient like 65 and it comes in with a, a mass, then you're thinking testicular lymphoma, especially if it's bilateral. Now, this lymphoma isn't usually primary, it's usually metastasis. So it's just kinda, we're just kinda talking about it because it affects the testicles. Everything else is gonna be primary testicular cancer, but because lymphoma can affect the testicles, we're gonna talk about it here. So if a patient is old, has a bilateral mass, you're thinking lymphoma. And this from metastasis. One of the markers is elevated LDH. That's lactic dehydrogenase. Lactic dehydrogenase, this is just some uh, side information. I don't think they'll quiz you on it. Um, lactic dehydrogenase converts pyruvate and lactic during glycolysis. And it's seen commonly in, in cells that need lactic dehydrogenase or make lactate, so anaerobic cells like your blood cells or your muscle cells. So it's no wonder in lymphoma, it's gonna be increased. It's also seen in various cancers because, it, you know, cancer cells need more energy, so they're gonna have a lot of lactic dehydrogenase. You're gonna see that on biomarkers. Again, that was just background information for what you need to know, just know lymphomas are seen in older patients, bilateral. So let's move on to your stromas. Your stromas are gonna be your support cells. So your support cells like your Leydig cells and your Sertoli cells. Can you recall what your Leydig cells produce? They produce testosterone. So you're going to have increased androgens on labs. If it's in a younger patient, like let's we'll say eight years old, then that increased androgen will give them precocious pu puberty. One other thing you're gonna see is these intracytoplasmic inclusions that look rectangular, these little crystals. We call those Ranke crystals. Very, very pathognomonic. A picture is in my notes. Uh, recognize that well because they can just show you that crystal testicular mass. What is it? It's a Leydig cell tumor. So totally cells, those are your support cells. Clinically silent, not much to know about them other than they exist. So just know Sertoli cells exist, but clinically not really, um, I guess, an important one. Germ cells are going to be your big ones. Again, that's 95% of your testicular cancers. So germ cells are broken up into two types. The vast majority of germ cell tumors are going to be seminomas. There's another category uh, It has about four different types, but because seminomas are the most common, we just call this whole category non-seminomas. Now, seminomas are a little bit more homogenous, but non-seminomas are a little bit more complex, can come from different types of tissue. So, so it can come from placental tissue and create things like choriocarcinomas. It can come from fetal tissue, create things like teratomas and embryonal tumors. It can come from yolk sac tissue and make endodermal tumors. So these are more complex and unfortunately they have a poor ER prognosis. So I'll just talk about seminoma first. That's the most common one. Seminomas, not much to talk about it other than it's the most common. It's this nice homogeneous mass and it doesn't have areas of necrosis, so no necrosis, or hemorrhage. Very neat mass, easy to identify. Again, the pictures will be in my notes. That does it for seminomas, let's move on to non-seminomas. If you see a homogeneous mass that does have necrosis and does have hemorrhage, then you're thinking of embryonal tumors. So embryonal, will be a mass with necrosis, with hemorrhage. I think that's all I wanna talk about for embryonal. Move on to the next one, next one of these, and that will be your endodermal, aka your yolk sac tumor. This one is exactly the same as your ovarian endodermal tumor. 
Can you recall the characteristics of that tumor? Pause the video if you could and just kind of list the facts. If you can't, that's fine. We'll just review it right now. Remember, your yolk sac is the first production site of AFP, of alpha fetoprotein, or the albumin of the fetus. So AFP is going to be elevated also. And if that's not enough, histologically, you see these glomeruloid-like bodies, these bodies that look like glomeruli. Glomeruli-like bodies. The non-scientific name is Schuyler duval bodies, and that is your endodermal tumors. So we talked about embryo, we talked about endodermal. Let's move on to choriocarcinoma. Again, we talked about choriocarcinoma during ovarian tumors. Can you recall the characteristics of choriocarcinoma? How about the pathogenesis at least? Choriocarcinoma is proliferation of your trophoblastic tissue, so your syncytial trophoblast, cytotrophoblast. Syncytial trophoblast release beta HCG, so that's going to be elevated. And beta HCG, recall, has two subunits. One is the beta subunit, that's the one we measure in, in the urine for pregnancy test, that's why we call it beta HCG. It has an alpha subunit that's, that's structurally similar to FSH, LH, and TSH, so you can have hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroid. And then one of the most important things you need to remember about choreo is that it loves the lungs. So chest x-ray, if you to see if there's mets to the lungs. And then last but not least, so that's choreo, last but not least, we have teratomas. So teratomas are the cool ones with different types of cell types. So you can have teeth and hair and all these cool things. So those are your teratomas in, in females, very common. It's the most common benign tumor. We just call it dermoid cyst. And most likely benign, we just take them out. But in males, they're more likely to be malignant. I think that's all I want to talk about for testicular pathology. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. See you next time.